when our kids were infants. Just beginning to walk, just beginning to talk with both of them. Their favorite word was no, a very emphatic no. Yeah, especially Jimmy. No was a response to any question you can ask. Are you hungry? No. And then they eat anything and everything in reach. Are you getting tired? No. And you look over pretty soon and poof, they're asleep. You want some ice cream or some chocolate? No. And, well, I'll let you all worry about the rest of them. A few, few years later, no longer infants, but still a young child. The favorite word was, why? Why'd you do that? Why do I have to do this? Their curiosity seemed to be unbounded. There was so much in this world that they wanted to know about and seemed like so little time to know it. And there was many times that that second why came before you got through explaining the first why. And to some extent, it's still going on, not asking me why, but the search for answers, and then I don't even understand the question. It's said that curiosity killed a cat. Anybody know what the cat wanted to know? Indeed, the common house cat is one of the most curious of all animals. Always seeking, always probing, always investigating anything that is new, anything that's different, anything that moves, anything that pikes its curiosity. We find in Luke 19, 1 through 10, the story of a man that had a very high degree of curiosity. Zacchaeus, by name. We're told that Zacchaeus was a rich man, a tax collector, a publican by profession. In verse 3, we're told that he was small of stature, a short man. We're not told that he was curious, but his actions demonstrate that fact. He wanted to see Jesus when he came by, but because he was short and because of the crowd, he couldn't see. Therefore, in verse 4, we're told that he climbed into a sycamore tree to get him above the crowd so he could see Christ. Evidently, Zacchaeus had heard some amazing things about this Jesus, and it made him curious. Someone came through Jericho a while back and said that he had fed 5,000 men, plus their women and children. And he only had five loaves and two fish to do it with. And that was up here by, uh, by Lake Galilee. Uh, and when it was all done, they put up 12 baskets of leftovers. Someone else said that he had seen him cast out demons and, and unclean spirits. Luke 8, 26 through 39, and Luke 9, 38 through 42. Another man reported seeing Jesus cleanse lepers and heal the deaf. Luke 17, 11 through 19. Luke 7, 22. Rumor has it that he raised the dead. John 11, 38 through 44. 
And yet another has, his, has said that he walked on the waters of Lake Galilee. And that was done during the, a very bad storm. Matthew 14, 22 through 33. And just today, over on the other side of town, he healed two blind men. Matthew 9, 27 through 31. Then there are other things that had Zacchaeus curious. Jesus didn't toe the party line in the ongoing feud between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Nor did he side with the scribes in, in, in their holier-than-thou attitude. He associated with publicans. He ate with publicans. He made a publican a hero of, of, of one of his sermons. He selected a publican as one of his apostles was even known as a friend to publicans and sinners. He preached about going, doing away with the traditions of the elders. You see, the Pharisees had made the tradition of the elders equal to or of greater value than the teaching of Moses. He urged people to follow the will of God and not man. And you know, this, this was enough to make this little man very curious. And Jesus was the, what was, he was accustomed to being the object of curiosity. As an infant, he aroused the curiosity of the Magi. That's, that's the wise men that came from the east in, in Matthew 2, verse 1 and 2. In Luke 2, 15 through 16, we see that shepherds were anxious to see this newborn son of God when told of the event by the angels. We read, and it came to pass, as angels were gone away from them in the, into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go now even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Angels peered down from heaven to see this new master's they were anxious about the new dispensation to them and we find this in Romans 16 25 Ephesians 3 10 and in several other places but to them it was still a mystery what was going to what happen what was coming and 1 Peter 1 12 says they desired to look into it so the angels were curious as well. In Luke 2, 25-32, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him that the Holy Ghost, by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him after the custom of the law, they took him up and then took he him up in his arms, and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen the salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory 
of thy people Israel. As a boy, Jesus excited the interest and the curiosity of the doctors in the temple. In Luke 2, 46 through and 7, we see, you know, he, he was with Joseph and Mary when they went to the temple to pay taxes, or when they went to pay taxes, and uh, they started home, and they got almost home, and they found that he wasn't with the group. When they finally found him, they found him in the temple asking and being asked questions. And when the doctors of the temple asked him questions, they were enlightened. As a man, two of John's disciples inquired about where he lived. John 1, 38 and 9. Nicodemus, uh, a busy ruler of the Jews, was curious enough to pay a visit to him after hours. John 3, 1 and 2. Simon the Pharisee wondered whether Jesus could be a prophet or not and, and invited him to a banquet, Luke 7, 36. Certain Greeks asked Philip to arrange for them a meeting with Jesus. John 12, 20 through 21. They wanted to be introduced to Jesus. They wished to inquire of him, to know him. And that should be our desire today, to be acquainted with him and to know him. The interest in Christ never wanes. Even near his death, Herod wanted to see him. Herod wanted to see him of whom all these marvelous things had been told. Luke 23, verse 8. Most of us first come to Jesus on this level because of curiosity. And even after 2,000 years, he is still the most talked about, most controversial human ever to reside on the planet Earth. Sure, we've heard some, some things, not sure we believe them yet, but curious. Things like born of a virgin. Are you for real? Yeah. He puts his hands on sick people and immediately they're made well. Yeah, right. I've seen charlatans on TV do that. But yes, actually, truly. Right. Huh. He walked on water. Ah, oh, come on. The only thing that got wet was the bottom of his feet. He called his friend Lazarus out of the grave. Sounds more like a Halloween story. But it was no story. Lazarus is the only man who ever died twice. Jesus was murdered by his enemies on a Friday, but on a Sunday morning, he arose again. For real? Yes, absolutely for real. And then, like Zacchaeus, there are other things for us too. Jesus forgave people everything. Like the woman caught in 
adultery. How about the murderer named Saul of Tarsus? <clears throat> he even prayed for his executioners. He catered to common folks. He chose ordinary people to be his most relied upon lieutenants. He made it sound like everybody could please him if he or she just wanted to enough. And everybody had the potential to make it to heaven. You know, these things are still enough to provoke our curiosity. It is good to be curious about everything, and especially spiritual things. A child's favorite word might be why, but an adult should not give up that word too easily. Einstein said the most important thing is not to stop questioning. No man becomes a fool until he stops questioning. Samuel Johnson once said that curiosity is one of the permanent and certain characteristics of a vigorous intellect. It's better to ask questions than to know all the answers. Paul, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, taught, prove all things. In other words, test them. Make sure they're good. Hold fast to that which is good. John, 1 John 4, verse 1, wrote, believe not every spirit, not every claim, not every thought, but try the spirits, test them, whether they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Jesus told the Jews to search the scriptures. John 5, 39. And urged his followers to be fruit inspectors. Matthew 7, 15 through 20. You know, Marshall Keeble has quite a, a sermon on being fruit inspectors. He insisted that God gave us eyes, ears, brains for a reason. Mark 7, 18. Matthew 13, 16. Luke 8, 18. Curiosity is not a thing to be crushed. Doubt is a prerequisite to learning. Curiosity leads to investigation. And the truth is never hurt by investigation. The writer of Psalms 34 verse 8 says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Thomas was not criticized by saying, except I shall see his hands, see in his hands the print of the nails and put my, uh, put my finger in the print of the nails and thrust my hand into the side, I will not believe. That's John 20, verse 25. Instead, he is remembered for his recorded comment on the next meeting with Christ. Christ meets him and says, Behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. That's verse 27. And in verse 28, Thomas answers and says, My Lord and my God. That confession. Jesus does not want 
anyone to be faithless but believing. In Acts 8, verse 30 through 40, we have the story about the Ethiopian eunuch. You're all familiar with that. Here's a man that traveled about a month and a half one way. Just to worship at the temple in Jerusalem. On the way back, his curiosity is still enough that he invites a stranger to come up into his chariot with him and explains Isaiah 53. We see the end of the story is that the Ethiopian went away rejoicing. The end of our curiosity should be rejoicing. God counted the Bereans more noble than those in other places because they investigated what Paul had preached. They tested the validity of what he said. Acts 17, verse 11. When we are curious enough, we will ask, for, ask questions, seeking answers. And in Matthew 17, verse 10, his disciples ask him, saying, Why then say the scribes and that Elias must come first? They were curious about what the scripture had said. They wanted to know. And how else do you find out unless you ask questions? Jesus satisfied their curiosity at this point. In verse 12, John the Baptist was that Elias of prophecy and had already come. In Acts 8, 31, And to him they had regard, because that for a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. You see, Simon the sorcerer was a magician. I use that term, the, the Bible doesn't. He had people fooled to thinking that he was somebody great. But in Acts 8 and 30 and following, his fakery is revealed. People leave him. And pretty soon, Simon himself is converted. So in verse 32, we see what happens when people start questioning this fakery. First Corinthians 14, 34. Paul writing here, let your women keep silent in the church. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also said the law. Here, and it, it, it's also in uh, uh, the first letter to Paul writes to Timothy. 
Here the apostle Paul is telling the Corinthian brethren how to worship services should be conducted. The old law forbid women to speak during the worship service. And that same prohibition uh, continues on into the New Testament worship service. But if a, if a woman has a question, if she is curious about something, verse 35, and if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. Here is the proper place and opportunity for a woman to ask questions, to answer, to answer those, uh, to, to seek answers, to satisfy her curiosity. I also see here the requirement that the husband at home is the one that answers those questions. Here a family home Bible study is suggested. And men, it is our duty, it's our responsibility before God to lead that study. In this study, we each one take our Bibles to see what is right. Each one of us. Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for re reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. 2 Peter 1, verse 3. According to his divine power, hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that calleth us to glory and virtue. If I write a book, and many have, if I write a book that lays out how to get to heaven, how authoritative will it be? Not very. Not very. Why? How can you tell somebody how to go where you haven't been? How can you tell somebody, give them a, a map, a road map, to a destination that you have only heard of, but you've never been there? All scripture is given by inspiration of God, not by Jim. John 6, 68 and 9. Then Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Who else can write and tell us how to get there? Each of us needs our own faith. Not a, this is what my parents taught me. Or a, most of my friends think this. Or my preacher te teaches this about faith. Um, all Christians need to be able to say, I believe this because the Bible says so and then know what the Bible says and where to find it. Investigation leads to knowledge 
And that leads us to faith. Romans 10, verse 17. If we give Jesus' claim a, a, a closer look, we can never come away disappointed. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. He is not less than we have heard, but more, much, much more. He astonishes people. Those who actually saw him were astonished beyond measure, it says, because he doeth all things well, Mark 7, 37. His claims are not empty. He is the fullness, that is the perfect, exact image in bodily form of God. Colossians 1.19 He is infinite. He is eternal. He is unchangeable. Impressed? Who wouldn't be? Faith leads to obedience. And obedience leads to salvation. Faith led Zacchaeus, led Zacchaeus to obey Christ. You know, Christ gave him two commands. Make haste and come down. And he quickly did both. Jesus told him, salvation is come to thy house this day. Luke 19, 9. Zacchaeus gave the impression that whatever Jesus asked for, or asked him to do, he would do. Jesus asked us to believe in him. John 3, 16. John 8, 24. He asked us to repent of our sins, Luke 13, 3. He asked us to be immersed in water that we might have our sins forgiven, Mark 16, 16. He asked us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, Titus 2, verse 12. We need to keep feeding our spiritual curiosity. You'll find that something much better than the nine lives of the cat. What did the cat want to know? I don't know. But I do know that when we quit searching, when we quit asking questions, when our curiosity wanes, we are dead. Physically dead or spiritually dead. The question is, each of us has to do now, is judge yourself. Are we spiritually dead? Or not? Are we asking questions? Are we seeking God's Word? All here have already put Christ on in baptism. But it's possible for us to fall away. When we do that, we quit asking questions. We quit seeking. The question tonight, are you dead or are you alive in the spirit? However we can help, let it be known as we stand and sing. Heaven of